The Man in Line with Andy Wint. Pastor Mai, good afternoon. Welcome to Man in Line on Manx Radio. Today, the Department for Enterprise... Uh, one of eight departments inside the government. And it does what it says. It is the department that stimulates enterprise on the Isle of Man. They have executive agencies, registries. They're responsible for strategy and policy. And basically, they're trying to get business for the Isle of Man. So how are we? Where are we? And where are we going? Tim Johnston, MHK, is the minister. And Mark Lewin is the chief officer. Uh, Faster Mike, good afternoon. Uh, it's uh, Tim. Hi, Tim. Hi, Mark. Faster Mike. Faster Mike. Faster Mike. Okay. Uh, so, where are we at the moment and where are we going forwards? First of all, just a quick resume of the conference, uh, Tim Johnson. How did you enjoy it? Get much out of it? Yeah, I think I did, actually. And I think, you know, it was really interesting talking to people during the events and certainly some of the feedback we've had. I think, um, you know, a lot of people felt it went well um clearly you know never going to please everybody with these things but i think the decision to obviously a different location um small slightly smaller venue um sort of more concentrated yeah. i think i think it, it led to from what people sort of said to me better debate i think and um so i think overall it's a good thing i think it's, it's good that we do it i think it's important that we do it like i say we did our our sort of road shows in the in the spring yeah. uh, i think that was that was again it's another opportunity and certainly the quite rightly the chief minister's committed that we'll do that again next year and i think that's again it's important that we get out and have those have these conversations and how do you explain i mean to, to members of the public to, to constituents even uh, the function of at the enterprise, uh, the ministry. How do you say, I mean, obviously finance, visit, digital, business, and bits located in there as well. How do you explain what you do? Because half the time it's happening behind closed doors or, you know, business is, is in the pipeline. How do you explain it to people? Well, on one level, obviously, we make sure that we publish what we're doing and we do that obviously through through Timwald and, and earlier on the year we, we published all, all the agencies published their, their plans for the year ahead setting out their targets and their, their ambitions for the year ahead and of course as a department we also published our department plan in, in May that was debated in May in Timwald so that's always that's always available and accessible for anyone on, on our website to go and see those and, and see what, what we're setting out Again, I think it's important that we have things like the conference where we can then talk about that and, and, and expand on it. And certainly, um, you know, economic development was an important part of, of the conference. So it gave me the ability to stand up and, and talk about that and, and some other officers to talk a bit about some other things we're doing. And I think, but you're right, I think it's a, it's a, it's a constant challenge we, we must take up to explain what we're doing and why we're doing things at, at times. And, and like you say, we don't own the economic strategy, but we're an important part of it. And the Department of Enterprise doesn't create jobs. Business creates jobs. Right. But, but what we're there to do is to help the, make sure the playing field is, is as level and as open as possible so that businesses can thrive and move forward. And we have those conversations with business about the, their challenges and what we can do to, to help that. Uh, the chief minister has been um, uh, leaving nobody under any illusions. He, he basically said times are tough at the moment. We are, everybody's under pressure. I mean, uh, does the department feel any pressure to, to move things along? Absolutely. I think, you know, that again, one of the things we recognise, and if you, and the, the Chief Minister talked about it, the sort of the idea of we, we must progress as an island, we mustn't regress. And some of that's based on some fundamentals around the fact we have an ageing population, the need to make sure that we're growing our working age population, because ultimately we have, we have uh, you know, public costs to pay for, and we need to make sure that we've got the income coming into the, into the exchequer for that. So, so an important part of that is growing business, growing the economy, making sure the island, island's an attractive, exciting place for people to want to come and live, and we need to invest to do that so it's it's really important we recognize that we've been through a really difficult time as an island i think as a world we, we've seen that we've seen some of the big issues that have affected us we, we we came in in a new administration in the september 21 we already started seeing inflation increasing we went into the war started in ukraine in 2022 and it's been a pretty difficult time and of course we were still coming out of covid at that stage so there's been lots of big issues that we don't necessarily have a direct control over 
that affect us. But what we have to do is is look through that and say, well, what what, what right. we're aiming for. And I think that's that's the whole point of having that plan, having the island plan, having the strategy. It says, yes, things come along and knock you, knock you sideways sometimes, but you've got to have a clear direction of what are the challenges we have and, are we, and what are we doing to, to, to sort of move forward. And that's certainly what we need to do in the so department. The, there's no such thing as standing still at the moment. We have to move forward. Absolutely no, no, no room for standing still. I think we, we see the challenges in, in, in the economy. I think we have to be also recognise that our, the health of our economy overall. I think you know we, we we're doing very well in, in in many ways. We've got more people to work now than we've ever had. We're, you know, we're seeing that job growth. That's really positive. But absolutely cannot you know hide the fact yeah. that some sectors especially are finding it really, really difficult. Okay. We've seen big hikes in energy costs over the last couple of years. We've seen increases in wage costs. People haven't got as much money in their pockets and not going out as much. So we're certainly seeing, for example, in hospitality, retail, those sectors, really difficult. So it, we, we cannot ignore that. But at the same time, we also have to say, fun, look, at, be confident enough to say that the fundamentals of what we're doing as an island, I think, are right. But let's not underestimate some of the challenges. OK. Um, uh, Mark Lewin. Uh, Mark, um, who are we up against uh, on a worldwide uh, playing field? Who, who's aiming to take our, our dinner off our plate? That's a great question, Andy. And uh, it, I guess it depends in terms of the context. So we talked about, you mentioned before, about visit and tourism. And clearly, you know, the whole of the British Isles is, is, a, is a target for, for that. And uh, we know there's more we can do in that space to, to grow our own market share. And we have an amazing offering and, you know, we'll continue to, to, to promote that. I think when you look at financial services, you're into a different group. So we, we work closely with some other jurisdictions, Jersey and Guernsey in particular, City of London, northwest of England, um, but then you'll find other centres around the world, Malta, Gibraltar, or, or, um, depending on in the markets in which the, the, the sectors face. One of the things the Department for Enterprise does a lot, as you'd expect, we talk to industry, we listen, and particularly through the executive agencies, that's where there is a grouping of people that can come together and talk about exactly that point, you know, what's happening in competitive markets, what are they doing in terms of responses, what are the ideas, how do we prioritise those and how do we take them forward? Okay, so, the executive agencies again are? So we have one for financial services, Finance Alaman. We have one that looks after our digital economy. Uh, we have one that looks after our, our both our domestic economy in terms of uh, hospitality, retail, construction, but also looks after our export, export sectors, food and drink, uh, engineering, etc. And that's business. And our fourth executive agency is our visit agency, which uh, clearly looks after tourism. Are we expecting any heat from a Labour government in the UK? It, it's certainly something we are uh, monitoring, and um, you know, even before one of the one of the, you know, before the change of administration, there was already extensive outreach both at a political level, but also at an, an officer level. We have lots of of, uh, of contact over a wide range of topics of mutual interest and areas that we wish to uh, progress. Clearly, when any new administration arrives and they 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 have a a set of things they want to pursue, you know, we're interested in that. We'll continue to watch. Sometimes they don't always pan out like that. Yeah. So it, it is still. Early I remember days when when Tony Blair got in. Was it the Andrews report that uh, uh, that lasted a couple of years and really didn't go anywhere, did it? They were expecting sort of millions hung, uh, hidden away in suitcases here, there, and everywhere, and, and nothing really happened last time. That, that, that's right. And some, sometimes that is about exposing the evidence. Let's so that, let's let's get underneath the covers of what perhaps there is a perception. You know, let's you know get under under into the detail, and that's what I think what happened then is when they looked at it in in detail. Like, you know that some of the perceptions just weren't borne out by 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 evidence. We are, you know, a very responsible partner internationally. Um, you know, we work hard at that. We work hard with with uh, with partners around the world, UK included. So, but I know there's a lot of a lot of uh, commitment to work with the new administration. There's. You know the conference is uh, just just about to start, and obviously the chief's there. I think, Minister, you're going next week. I'm going to the Conservative Party conference right. as well because, again, you know, we have to make sure that we're keeping close relations with with our colleagues in, in Westminster. I think the point you made, Andy, before, you know, about we have to work hard because, unfortunately, there are sometimes misconceptions mm. about about what we do, and therefore we have to make sure we're working hard to constantly explain who we are, what we're doing, and, and, and the, the high standards that we work to. Um, 
there's always, whether Labour or Conservative, there are always people who champion the island and, and understand us, but there are always those who maybe don't understand. Yeah. And so it's, it's important that we engage and we have those conversations and we keep those those relations going. Because even, even in opposition, you have members, for example, in the Conservative Party who will be sitting on select committees, etc., in Westminster that, you know, maybe asking questions around justice and other areas. We need to make sure that we're, we're speaking to them and we're having we're having those close relations. And typically, what will you be doing at the, at the Tory party conference? Well, I think it's, again, it's always an opportunity to meet people um, across the, the party, people who've only just recently come out of, of government and therefore are very, you know, knowledgeable. I think one of the interesting things was mentioned at the, the conference, actually, by the, uh, we had an, an individual from Lexington talking about Westminster, and the point he was making was, you know, the new Labour government, there's huge amounts of inexperience there in, in, in those people coming into government for the first time. Um, that's going to take time um, to build that experience. We need to make sure that they fully understand who we are yeah. uh, through that process. At the same time, there's that collective memory still within the Conservatives, the Conservative Party. Again, we need to make sure we're, we're linking into that and still carrying on with those conversations. OK, to the phones we go. Neil's with us. Hi, Neil. You're with uh, Tim Johnston and Mark Lewin from Enterprise. Good afternoon, Andy, and good afternoon to your guests. Um, my question is very simple. Um, what plans are projected for the Ronald Ray Airport um, gateway project, which has been mooted now for 10 or 15 years? The reason I ask is I know that the government have acquired approximately about 40, 45 acres of land from the rear of the um, western side of the Ronald Ray Aircraft Company. Um, there's a large area of land there. Um, some of the area is zoned as business parks. Some of the area further south towards where I live is actually zoned as open space. Now, some of this open space uh, land has recently been overruled by planning and they're allowing housing to go on here. So are the area plans actually worth the, the paper they're written on? Because my answer to that would be no. And secondly, I would like to know, um, do I have to leave this area now before there's a huge impact on my property and those of my neighbours? Or what plans are actually in place for this area, please? We would like to know. Uh, Tim Johnson? Well, thank you for your question. I think it's it's difficult to answer some of that. I think when, we, when we're looking at planning policy and, 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 and you know pl planning processes, I'm not I'm not really in a position to be able to sort of sort of comment on that directly and what what may be happening as far as the, the broader plan of the airport. And I think some of the discussions that we had at the conference that then the bigger plan, which will be more detailed to come, is actually how the how the, how the the airport funds itself and 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 goes forward and 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 how it how we make sure we're generating the returns to be able to invest in the airport and i think we all recognize that that needs to happen and we need to improve those facilities connective is really important what you find in the uk is a lot of small a small air, airport like which what run what ronald's way is they obviously own and manage a lot of the, their estate and and, and they, how they how they raise income is obviously off, often to how they manage that that. So I think that'll be part of a much broader plan coming forward with the new the new board that'll be going in place uh, for the airport, so that they're looking much more holistically at, at the whole the whole site really and, and what that means. But I I can't really comment specifically on on sort of that sort of those development issues. How is it going to affect you, Neil? Well, the land directly to the north of me was is actually zoned as open space, which is the same designation as Mackle Brews or Santon Head or any of the glens on the island. Now, I would have thought the area plan would have retained that classification because um, that's the soundbite by which most people on the island, um, you know, go forward. We, we need to know what's happening within our areas. However, a chunk of that has recently been um, overruled by the planning inspector and, and now has been zoned for housing. But I do know that... Um, to the western side of Rolls Royce Aircraft Company, there were plans in place for a cannabis facility. Um, I did see people out there um, and surveying the area, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And there's a huge amount of land there. It goes right down to the railway line. It extends down towards the Sefton Express, 
And um, it would be interesting to know what's actually happening on the area. It's not the airport itself I'm concerned about. It's the it's the surrounding area to it and what the plans are for, for the future on that land. OK, uh, Tim? Well, I think, yeah, you, you mentioned the, um, the sort of some of the development and obviously opposite the, like you say, quite rightly, opposite the airport there is the what's called the Airport Technology Gateway. That is an area that is uh, classified for, for sort of light engineering, manufacturing, etc. Um, and obviously there are businesses obviously on that site. And... Yes, there is a there is an application there to, to look potentially to develop a, um, um, a medicinal cannabis facility there. Clearly, that's a that fits in within the classification yeah. of land use. So, absolutely, that is that is being there's a process at the and moment. And that's on the, that. the Ronalds Way site, the the industrial estate. There. That's right, and 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 I think what we've seen in the past, of course, is and this is often some of the complications of government of who owns what and who manages what and I think part of that whole process of looking at the airport is saying well who, who manages that, that whole area who, who receives a return of, of that area etc and uh, that's that's some of the processes going on at the moment yeah. okay I could just perhaps add Neil certainly from a department for enterprise perspective that the land that is owned for industrial so not not the open space but that, that is something that we continue to uh, market we are committed to making sure we invest in areas to make sure it, it is presentable so things like around the entrance, working with partners, particularly working with the landowners and the other the uh, tenants, etc., in that area to make sure that, that you know ultimately we have a long term sustainable business park, industrial park in in in, in that area. Okay, all right, Neil, thanks for that. Uh, just on another uh, 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 sub- well, uh, related subject, whatever happened to our, uh, the the, the much vaunted cannabis industry that was going to come here? Where where are we with that, Tim Johnson? Still very much in, in train, Andy. I think I think you know it. Ha- it is complicated, obviously, getting the processes in place and ensuring that the right licensing is in place and inspections. And that's that's that takes that takes time, and that's yeah. that's legislative change as well. And that that is a process that we've been going through. But as I say, there is a, there is a an application in now planning application in for for a for a site on the ATG. That's now in in progress. Um, so we look forward to see the results of that. So certainly. Yeah, absolutely recognising that one of the keys of the economic strategy was how do we diversify our economy, look at new markets, new opportunities. And clearly, um, this is a sector that, that, that came came up very quickly and is something we're, we're willing to, we're wanting to sort of um, make the most of. But it is a, it is a, I wouldn't say controversial subject, but yeah. obviously, it, it, of course, that you have to have make sure you have the, the right checks and balances and legislation in place to make it make it work commercially okay. going forward. Okay, here's a message in from Les, who just said you mentioned the aircraft registry that uh, Enterprise looks after, one of the registries. Um, can you give me just a, a, a brief pencil portrait, um, um, uh, Mark Lewin? What does the aircraft registry does? And it, palpably, it obviously makes money for us. But where did it come from, and and how is it doing? nowadays so, so there's two aspects of it the the civil aviation authority which is its 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 technical term it, it looks after the regulations that apply to the Isle of Man in this space so it also includes the regulation of the airport regulation of our airspace aerodrome etc it also has an international uh, facility uh, very much looking out and supporting uh, owners of aircraft of different types um, and uh, the idea was, was was many years ago now but but in terms of we're already doing some some services we provide um, very much working with the likes of the UK it was at the time but how can we do that in a way that provides better service and it, that really was the, the the thing that differentiated us so being able to a you know, small team of people that can speak to to customers can help them, can advise them on the regular the relevant safety standards to make sure that we, you know, operate a really, um, you know, a really strong, uh, attractive proposition for those those aircraft owners. And uh, over many many years, we've seen lots and lots of aircraft um, uh, come and provided some good services. And then over the last number of years, we've seen the market changed. Other jurisdictions have come on board. The propositions changed slightly, and we've seen a, a, a reduction on on those numbers over over, over time but we still provide a really you know, highly regarded service to those um, those owners that use use the Alman aircraft registry. Okay, uh, Michael's with us now. Hi Michael, you're live with the Department for Enterprise. Fast am I, Andy, Mark and Tim. Fast am I. Fast am I. Um, right, so last year the um, DFE put up the minimum wage again and rumour has it it's going to be put up again for, for next year. And then Treasury comes along, 
and put tax up by two percent. But the the one that didn't really get the uh, the headlines, which I thought was was bigger for business, etc., was the nine percent in national insurance. Now, so th- basically, the 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 poorer paid got very little out of that increase because it was taken away with the other hand. Um, yet the the people in the middle, the businesses, um, they're whacked both ways. Um, it, I think it was Tim. Uh, already alluded to the fact that there's less money in people's pockets. Um, yet, all along, um, I'm talking from a hospitality view, all along, um, hospitality uh, businesses are expected to um, take the impact of the ever-increasing wages. And it's not the minimum wage that's the real killer. It's the fact that the people above the minimum wage won't work for minimum wage. So their wage has to go up as well. And yet, as he said, there's no money in anybody's pockets. So people don't want to, you can't put the prices up all the time because people just haven't got that money to pay. Money to pay. So basically, you, we've seen so many really good standard businesses going to the wall or just giving up because they, they, they can't continue anymore. Um, I, see, I see that it's politically astute to, in some ways to raise um, minimum wages because it looks like you, you're really good politicians. But what I think what it's really about is uh, getting extra um, revenue for government. Um, uh, also, so just one, of the, I, I realise you can't turn back, put, the genie back in the bottle now but I think one thing that you could do would be to have a, an interim period between um, 18 and 21 years of age because at the moment so, since somebody uh, their birthday their wages go up massively um, it doesn't encourage business to employ young people uh, because they're mainly inexperienced so I, I just think that would be one way that they could help us. But I, I realise you're uh, DFE and not Treasury, but still. OK, Tim Johnson. Thank you. And I think, you know, you raise an interesting, some interesting issues there. And that's that difficult balance and challenge that we have between recognising, for example, that you know, the cost of living on, on an island are, are, are higher. Um, we, we, we know that. The need... And we see the number of um, vacancies we have in our economy at the moment and the challenge of keeping our young people on Ireland um, in, 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 a, in jobs that, that are at a decent pay and also being able to attract young people and, other, and people to the island to work in our economy. And therefore, it is important that we make sure that we are uh, competitive and providing you know minimum minimum levels of payment that that, that recognise that. And that's why you know, the government is committed... Um, through the island plan to to actually move towards a, a living wage uh, in next year. As far as the setting of the minimum wage is concerned, that is not done by DfE, and that is done independently, assessed through a, the minimum wage committee. That's an independent body that sits and rec- makes a recommendation, um, and that recommendation is then taken forward to DfE and Treasury for for further discussion, and 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 a, and, and then a recommendation is put forward. And as you say, we had a, um, the the raise in the interim period in the, from the 1st of July this year um, up to £11.45 for the, for the main rate and a youth rate of £8.75. There was a t- I believe there was a, it was a Timmel decision several years ago to, to change the bandings to make sure that, that, that we are rec- recognising some of these challenges that if we are wanting to track people that you know we do need to have those, those competitive rates. I think there's a broader piece of work, which, you, you, which you, some of the, what you, you're talking around, around taxation and, and probably around thresholds, etc. And certainly, I know there's a th- through the tax strategy that was mentioned and brought forward by by the Treasury Minister, there is work going up in, into that to look ahead to make sure that some of those those areas are, are being looked at around, around thresholds and where obviously where people start paying different levels of tax, because I think that is an issue that we recognise. But ultimately, um, we also have to be competitive. Mm. Uh, So, Michael, how difficult is it um, to just put your prices up? Uh, Well, we're we're not just competing with the island. We're competing with the rest of the world. Um, And it's difficult to attract 
uh, customers into the food door in the first place, but then, you know, people just they haven't got the money in their pockets to pay. So, I mean, we've we kind of got two tranches to our business. Um, the, the restaurant and the and bar. Yeah. And also the accommodation. So in some ways, we're, we're kind of luckier than other uh, businesses, but it, it's very difficult when we've got the, the likes of the, the steam packet of charging a lot. So we're, on that on that area of the business, it's quite difficult. Sometimes, you know, we sell a room and then people come back to us and say, well, they can't afford to get here, so it's cancelled. So, but that, that's very difficult. And also, um, you know, constantly putting the prices up people just can't afford to pay it now and they won't pay it have you got so the it, same number of staff as you used to have Michael um no 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 we have to uh, just make do somehow <laughs> so you you've 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 cut back we're, on we're, uh, uh, yeah yeah um it, it's a very difficult equation it, it, it really is um and you, you, once you've got staff, you don't want to lose them again. So, um, but there's a big difference between the summer and winter trade. I mean, I, we've used quite a lot of school-aged um, people over the last uh, year or so, but uh, 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 a lot of them try very hard, but they, they also have their limitations. Okay. All right. No, um, we appreciate that, uh, Michael. Th- uh, thanks for all those points. Actually, uh, in a couple of weeks' time, we'll be talking to Deborah Heather and Ronald Corwell from Visit Isle of Man, so no doubt we'll come back to tourism more in the future. But the question of minimum wage is an important one. Uh, you mentioned recently, uh, Tim Glover, didn't you, that um, hospitality businesses will have to ask themselves difficult questions about sustainability. What did you mean by that? I think we're having a conversation about um, the creation of our new hospitality um, board. board. Yeah, yeah. We saw, and you know, we, we, we've seen some of the challenges um, expressed by um, businesses on Ireland, and especially in the retail, hospitality, leisure sector. As you recall, we had a we had a meeting uh, before TT. Uh, it was the Manx Museum where we had a lot of a lot of people came together to talk about some of these challenges, and that led us to some short-term support plans over the TT period to help businesses. But what the whole that whole process really tells you is the importance of us getting in a room together, talking about what are the issues and how we can help and how we can move forward. So I'm really pleased that we've seen this, this body formed because it's not good for anybody having sort of erratic sort of disparate views coming in from all different angles. I think it's important that we get people in a room together people who have that knowledge in the business in the businesses and to work together towards towards something that is more sustainable so i think as a government we've got a new local economy strategy the work that's going on at, that at the moment for the dfe and the business agency you know we're talking about visit and the importance of getting increasing footfall for businesses on the island and making sure that we're, we're businesses are attractive for, for customers we had our Manx menu competition early, early on the year which I think those people who involved found really positive so let's make sure we're doing all we can to drive footfall and into businesses but part of that whole process is having that bigger conversation about sustainability and as a government when we're looking at putting taxpayers money and support into into parts of the economy we've got to make sure we understand what what that money's doing and I think it needs to be something that's sustainable and, and defendable and, okay. I think that, and, and that's part of that process We're live with uh, Department for Enterprise today Mark Lewins the Chief Officer and Tim Johnston MHK is the Minister Next I've got a couple of questions about motorsport Foot or leg problems then contact Pop Podiatry where all services are carried out by an HCPC registered and qualified podiatrist using the latest clinically backed treatments and devices including the new Swiss Shockwave high powered laser treatment for tendinopathies plus nail surgery Veruca treatment and more conveniently based at the nunnery in Douglas see what Pop Podiatry can do to help you for your free assessment book online today get back on your feet soon with poppodiatry.com Island Hearing Limited your local hearing care specialist since 2009 with branches in Port Erin and Ramsey 
we provide the very latest hearing aid technology available, which you can try at home, with excellent aftercare and a wax removal service available using micro suction. Give us a ring on 830 722 or visit Island Hearing at One Station Road, Port Erin. We're happy to help. Island Hearing, always listening. When you need a fitting memorial or headstone for a loved one, contact Manx Memorials in Peel. This long-standing family-run Manx company offer a wide range of granite and marble headstones and memorials, along with an island-wide inscription and renovation service. Manx Memorial's skilled professionals will take the time to help you choose a suitable memorial, and we're proud to say we'll beat other local quotes. Call 843-861 or email matthew at manxmemorials.co.uk. The Isle of Man Festival of Motoring is back this September, and this year we're celebrating the very best of Britain with a huge gathering of British classic and sports cars. Have a ride with the Sporting Bears at Douglas Prom on Saturday the 21st, with all proceeds going to Lukey's Aid Charity. Find out more at iomfm.com. Enjoy the best of British with the Isle of Man Festival of Motoring, revving up the island this September. Coming up, we have another winning weekend here on Manx Radio. And this time, we're giving you the chance to win £200 to spend in-store at B&B Furniture. All you have to do is listen out for a winning question, which we'll ask on air right across the weekend. And once you've heard it, text your answer to 166-177. B&B Furniture is celebrating over 45 years of serving the island with lots of anniversary offers. And to mark 30 years in their purpose-built store, they're offering up to 30% of selected items. Make this your winning weekend with B&B Furniture and your nation station, Manx Radio. The Man in Line with Andy Wint. With Tim Johnston, MHK, and Mark Lewin. Uh, Mark, here's a, a message about uh, the airport. Losing the engineering facility at the airport was a disaster. You've got a large facility lying rotting there. Any plans to chase airlines to offer, uh, as an offer, to relocate that part or their engineering facility uh, to the hangar? So, so I think any loss is 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 a challenge for us, and and I do understand. And the the building has been empty for some time. We work with lots of different areas across government. So in this case, we do work with the airport, has a new airport board with non-executive directors, and we are collectively really keen to see all of the facilities down there used to full full potential. So there are conversations. Obviously, I can't go into detail now, but a number of people are are showing real interest in the various different facilities down there, and that's something I know that. The airport board is really keen to see come to fruition. The things that will value both the economy, but also provide value to the airport. Yeah, I mean they were very well-paid jobs and skilled jobs, weren't they? Uh, they were. Once they were. were the Manx Airlines uh, uh, engineering facility, and, and it highlights the challenge in that, that that area where you know that that existed because planes were planes were able to fly here and, yeah. and be serviced. And ultimately, when the planes change and different needs change, and then there are other places closer to where those planes are operating, you know that was the thing that really you know took that advantage away do you play any part in attracting airlines to the isle of man we play a real part again working with the airport board um, working with the department of infrastructure in terms of looking at what the routes need to be talking to the airlines um, certainly earlier this year we've become far more engaged in that and we're now leading a piece of work with with the airport around what the longer term needs to look like in terms of sustainable core routes regional routes providing much more long-term stability in in some of those areas so yes we do talk to the Airlines talk very much hand in hand with, with, with the airport board and their, their team there. Now, uh, Logan Air obviously saved our bacon during COVID, uh, but obviously we have subvented them. We've put money into some of those routes. Are we the only people that subvent routes? Does it happen anywhere else? It happens all around the British Isles and indeed it happens uh, further afield as well. I think th- post-pandemic is a completely different world of aviation than, than obviously before um, before 2000. Uh, most of the, in fact many of the routes to take Logan Air as an example that they fly to and from has some form of either local or national intervention to, to support that. So you, you're quite right to, to say that um, you know they were a real lifeline for us alongside the, the, the steam packing 
coming out from that, helping to make sure we, we grow um, responsibly and sustainably the, the root network. You know, we've, we've had to, as, as government, step into some of that space to provide choice, both choice of airlines, choice of routes, uh, choice of times, etc. And I know that's something we're really keen. We recognise that that's more we're looking forward. We're probably going to need to continue to do that. And actually some of the other routes as well, where our economy is telling us and our society are telling us that they, they want better, longer term connectivity than that's something again we're going to have to put into the mix to say what role does government have in that uh, to play in that place okay uh, the island infrastructure um uh, project is is where government uh, puts money into uh, companies that are putting specific projects is that right yeah th- th- andy this 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 goes back to some of the discussions that we had at, after the last election when we we're looking at these are privately owned brownfield sites so some yeah. of these sites that we see around the island that have been laying empty for for many many years decades in some cases and saying you know this is this this, this is not a good look what, you know what can we do to stimulate uh, the development of these sites and get some of the things we want to see built as well as, as, as an island when we talk about you know, the infrastructure we need yeah. going forward. So typically so, places like the Villiers Hotel, that's right. on, which has been decades, 30 years. Yeah, absolutely. And I think so the idea is to have those conversations with people who own these sites and say, OK, clearly you're not doing anything on these sites well there's obviously a reason why you're not because you, you you're doing the sums and working out that this isn't this isn't viable so it's, it's about viability right. so we say what can we do to get you to do something on this site to make sure that we're getting some development going forward and that is therefore looking to how we help leverage that private investment by government putting a small amount into that um, so for a resident a residential development up to 10 percent and on a mixed development maximum of up to 25%. And that is based on the calculations of viability of that of, of that development, with the principle being that no public funds or money would actually be paid out until that development is fully built and completed. Right. But of course, through that process, which would take a few years of construction, we would already get back half of that commitment we put in anyway through just through the exchequer benef- right. benefit from the construction and the this activity. is what the members of the public sometimes don't understand that for let's just say typically for for the the villiers site that will employ dozens of people at least to obviously to tip concrete to put steel girders up yeah. to to design the whole thing so you reckon that the money will come back through receipts you know what what is it 25 percent we, we, we were looking at a, a commitment on a on a on a um, a mixed site like that. So we're looking at uh, I think an eighty bed hotel. There's look at there's, there's there's new office space, new retail space. That's a, what you call a mixed development. So the maximum grant we will be looking at will be up to twenty five percent on something like that. And like you say, through that construction activity, that commitment, that say 20, if it was twenty five percent, you'd be looking about looking to get about a half of that back through that construction process. Right. But then of course. The operation of that building and those buildings going forward will then also bring a return. So, it would, it's a, it's a, it's cost neutral right. to government. And you guarantee not a penny goes to the developer until, until it's, it's handed, completed. Until it's handed over. So, yeah. but we get built what we want to see built, and we get this, and we move things forward, and that's and that's what we're trying to do as a, as, a, as an island, as a, as a government, to say, because one of the issues that people do raise when we talk about increasing the working age population, etc., and people say, well, hang on, what about the infrastructure? Well, these this is these are the sort of things we need to do. So, that's very much on privately owned sites. Then we also have the Manx Development Corporation, which is looking at the well, pu- the publicly owned sites in principle mainly, um, although they may well do some work elsewhere yeah. as well. Again, it's about looking at space and saying how can we reimagine this, how can we make this work better for us. Well, David Peach was saying from the board they want land, they want government to release some land uh, for places like they got their eyes on the Park Road School. Sorry. Yeah, and, and of course, what they're doing is they've got existing um, projects which are, are well advanced. With the first one being the, the the old nurses' home, and the confidence that's going to be completed early next year, which is really gr- great. There's obviously ongoing sites around Westburn Road. Clearly, what they're always doing is looking ahead to say, well, what's what's next? You know, what's in, what's in the pipeline? And they want to have those conversations with government. Um, often, sites are owned in different departments. Sometimes, I think there is frustration at the time it takes sometimes to to get through some of those processes. But the main thing is we we have those conversations and we have a pipeline going forward to keep, right. to keep momentum. So government doesn't own it as a whole. It's de- departments that own the land. Is that right? Well, I think it's important to understand when we talk about Isle of Man government, actually Isle of Man government as an entity doesn't actually exist. What we have are 
department and, and and different departments own own different bits of land and part of the work that's going on at the moment and has been for a few years is actually understanding and getting all that in one place so we, we, we can we could make quicker decisions and, and manage that, that 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 national estate if you like in more effectively okay Tony hi Tony you're live with the department oh, yeah. for enterprise good uh, good afternoon I just like one correction there the, the departments don't own anything it's all owned by the taxpayer. There needs to be a clear-cut admission by the government that they don't own these things, they're just managing them for us. And when you say things like that, you lead to the wrong area, if you like. I think you should be very careful of saying the departments own anything, because they're only holding it in trust for the people who are paying the taxes. Right, so my original question was... I'm not sure if this falls under your remit, but there's two things. One, you've got an ageing population, which you're well aware of. Some of them are paying taxes, some aren't. But the issue is, a lot of them are sitting in houses that are not suitable for them going forward. And a lot of them could release those houses to the market. And I don't know how you do that, but there must be methods to do that and thereby move those older people into homes which are more suitable in the long term, or residences where they can live as a group or individually. Now, I don't hear very much about any assistance for the companies out there who already have homes. Uh, I mean care homes. Um, And I don't see why we don't have that as a driver, because if you do that, you will stimulate the economy because you'll release housing and you won't have to build new housing, you'll be able to rent old housing. The second thing is, along the same sort of lines, the government has never made any effort to do anything with the post offices. And I'm at a bit of a loss to understand why. Maybe you could explain that. But the post office could be an alternative for bank branches for those people who live out in the countryside and, again, are older and don't want to drive to the main branch in Douglas because you can't catch a bus. It would take you all day to do a a, a trip to the bank. Um, I think there's uh, opportunities which are very simple but are not being even spoken about. Okay, all right, let's go. First of all, uh, the post office thing. Post office reports to you, doesn't it? Yeah, ultimately the post office is obviously is a, is a statutory board. It has its own it has its own board it, it, in itself. But as far as the structures are concerned, it it, it it comes under the remit of the Department for Enterprise. But right. it very much we, we don't actually influence decision. It is very much run as an entity as as, as a post office. Okay. Any thoughts on what Tony said? Yeah, I, I, you know, and I think it raised some interesting points there. And I think and I think you know, initial point. I, I know what you're saying. I think ultimately. Um, you're absolutely right to say that, of course, um, we are the ultimately the pub, the taxpayer yeah. is the ultimate owner. But clearly, legally, there are um, sure. owners uh, of these of this property. And, he was and, objecting and to your shorthand, I but think. yes. yes. So, I, so apologies if I didn't mean to sort of cause an issue there. I think that issue around housing is really important, and I think and I think we all know. Housing is one of those the big issues we have, whether it's for well, for all demographics and all age groups, and certainly that the recognition that, that there are people who I think would be keen to downsize potentially, which would free up property, is a, is a really good one. And I think again, part of the work that's going on at the moment with the the housing board, looking at objective housing need and actually understanding what we what do we need and where is really important because again we need to make sure that when we do make decisions, they are calculated decisions and costed decisions and we don't just go down a rabbit hole and do one thing and realize we, we, we haven't you know we haven't sorted another problem out so certainly that work that work is going on I think that's very important and as far as um, sort of on the care home side and I mean ultimately these are sort of commercial decisions and I think we look we what we're seeing now is more people are st- staying living in their homes for longer no. um, clearly if there's if there is demand for for that um, I would hope that there's opportunity for that capacity to be to be realised in 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 the, in the in the private mm. private market. Okay, all right, Tony. Thanks for that. Got to go on because I, there was uh, uh, I've had half a dozen um, uh, messages about MGP, uh, and the polite ones I can tell you. Um, can the minister say that he feels that shortening the MGP since 2022 has it been a big success? 
some people aren't happy. Yeah, and I, and I appreciate this is a very emotive topic. We've had a really difficult festival this year. The weather was, was, was appalling, and that's made it really, really difficult. Clearly, some of these issues have been longstanding and, and of concern. From my point of view, I think it's, it's important to remember that from a DfE point of view, um, we we don't we don't own or run the the Manx Grand Prix. This is a, this is an event put on by the Manx Motorcycle Club, um, working closely with ACU. From a DFE point of view, of course, we we, we offer support because we have those structures there for the yeah. TT, and we offer and help where we can operationally and obviously the paddock. But decisions that so have been made. So it's nothing directly to do no, with the department. So whereas the motorsport department is is involved in the, the TT. TT. Yeah. So the decisions made about. Um, scheduling and, and, and timing etc that's something and that was part of work that's happened in the past by by the match Grand Prix itself through consultation and and, and planning and, and that's so that's very much for them right. to decide from, our, from people, our point of view people are asking did you strong arm them into shortening it no, that's not, no, absolutely not. I mean, this is this is very much their event. We we will support this. You know, this 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 has a a considerable cost to us as a department. To help that support, uh, but we 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 recognise the importance of it. I think what we want to see, and I think what I would say to anybody, and I think this is a, a subject like you say, people get very passionate about, is what we all want to see is a long term sustainable plan for motorsport and the Grand Prix is very much part of that and we're happy to work with with the the Max Motorcycle Club and ACU we we had meetings before the before the Grand Prix we've had um, some meetings since then and certainly happy to sit down with them and talk about the future about some of the challenges recognizing that you know this type of event now is 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 struggling elsewhere you know we it is a challenge there are costs involved so we want to make sure it we can make it work for the future and we're, we'll, we're happy to sit down with them and, and, and help where we can. Okay. If I could just add, I think absolutely there's been a lot of a lot of feedback, there's been a lot of emotion, there's been a lot of, of criticism. Really keen to stress and add what the Minister said, but there are many decisions made by, by, by various different elements of organisations that are done for the best intentions with a lot of complexity behind it that, that perhaps sometimes it's difficult to appreciate from, from, from the outside. What I would just say is, particularly this year, looking back, also taking some of the feedback from previous years, I know there is a commitment from all parties to take some of that feedback on board, to, to go back and look at what, what can be done to, to, can, to try and respond to that. But it is really, really complex. There are lots of considerations. But, but I just I just want to emphasise, I know you know, there's a real desire to say, let's, let's listen, let's look at it, and let's see if there are specific things that can change. Bear in mind, as the Minister said, this is absolutely not our event. It's not, not government's event. But we are we are a real stakeholder. We are a real supportive partner in that. And we will do what we can to try and make sure, as the Minister said, that there is a really successful event for, for many, many years to come. OK. Has the, uh, the, the dust settled on TT 2024? How was it for the department? Uh, I, I think there is still probably always there is still a little bit of just fine waiting until the end of the year to check the numbers and how they fit with everything else but um, generally the feedback right across the economy right across society from a race perspective amazing racing um, from a visitor perspective really really strong numbers from a spend perspective economic perspective you know really strong 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 numbers and uh, more and more people watch the event over our broadcast channels around the mm. world so definitely lots of positivity that come from that but as always we take a step back we listen we learn we move forward and is it true uh, emotions do get high regarding uh, tt and mgp uh, absolutely it's uh uh, it, it, it's it's an interesting space for, for government to be in, in in something like this, but uh, there are passions uh, uh, and from from all all all, all aspects of okay. that. And, it's uh, part of our DNA, Dan, uh, Andy, isn't it? Yeah. You know, motorsport. It's okay. people have real passions about it. That's understandable. Thanks for being with us today, uh, Tim Johnson, MHK, and Mark Lewin. Next Tuesday, David Ashford is here, chair of the Communities and Housing Board. We'll be talking about, yes, the vexed question of housing and a week today. The Chief Minister's on. Alfred Cannon, MHK, will be on Man in Line. Uh, back with an open line on Monday. Thanks to Chris Quirk on the phone today. Enjoy the weather. Have a good weekend. W I N T 60 years.
years serving you as the nation station. This is Manx Radio. Hector Duff was an extraordinary Manxman. Holder of the Military Medal for Bravery and an OBE, he spent many hours telling school pupils about his war experiences, which included coming ashore on D-Day. Before he joined up, though, his memories were of farming in the island. Because they had meadows down at Solby. Oh, yes. Down the Kellia, not the Kellia, the Kellia we call it. Right. And the Kellia. What do they keep there? Uh, that just hay. They used oh, to cut, cut the meadows for, for the hay for the winter for the, their own horses. Mm. And that, that entailed... Um, there was two horses, you had to have a trace horse, but Willie had a, a, a stable down at Thalter Will, which is now the craft centre. There's this craft centre there now. Yes. And uh, I would go down with the two horses and the, and the, the stiff cart, which mm. was called a flat bogey, mm. and we'd leave, I'd leave one, the trace horse there, so I'd leave them in the stalls there and feed them, and I would go on with the one horse down to Solby, and... Uh, loaded up with hay and the stiff carts it weren't a flat bottom one then and with being the hills the back of it sloped up quite high quite oh, high so yeah. it stopped the the load slipping off yeah so i would load it up with that and uh, walk and go back up with that walk all the way uh-huh. back up to thalderwell and then get the trace horse in again and uh then go up, round up, and negotiate the bends up round Thalterwill until we got into the Creggans. And there was always a fear or danger then that um, with you going up the steep hill, if the load was too high in the back, it would that it would go down and would lift the horse up. Oh, right. The horse that was in the shaft so would yeah. lift him off his feet. So you always Did had, that ever happen to you? No, it never happened to me, but you always had to carry a knife. Willie ensured that I had a knife because on the on the ha- the collar of the horse, there were ho- things called homes, which the... the cart was the, the uh, was chained into mm. and if you cut the strap on that the homes fell away and of uh-huh. course the horse could feet would come down onto the floor again yeah. no it, ne- it never happened to me but uh, it it had happened to Willie in times uh-huh. i think yeah. so that's what we that was sort of that was the job during the summer or the autumn months getting the hay back up and you were taught all sorts of little tricks about how to to load the hay and how to how to you were on your own doing it loading it you were mm. We used to taught, uh, teach you how to uh, to rope to secure the hay onto the cart yeah. because you couldn't pull it yourself. But we used to make like a little loop and put it through like a, so it made it a pulley effect so you could uh, tighten it up quite yeah. quite uh, hard on your own. Uh. Part of island life for 60 years. This is your Manx Radio. 